Did any of you make it to Dr. Collins' talk, or either of them? It was awesome. It was very, very cool. I greatly appreciate it. It's really the first one thinking about gene editing and de-extinction and those kinds of things. So I thought that was a lot of fun. And we're very lucky to have gotten him here. Um, those of you who went to the first talk may have heard or overheard that it was co-sponsored by Sigma Xi, which is the Scientific Honor Society, which I'm very fortunate to be a member of. But it's a really great thing. And there are undergraduate members as well as graduate student members as well. So if it's something you're interested in, um, I highly ran, recommend taking a look at it. And I can give you some more information if you're interested in looking at more detail. So last time we talked about the viruses that most people are scared of, and the rest of today, today, we should be talking about the viruses that people should be scared of, as opposed to these guys. Uh, the phyloviruses, of course, from a molecular point of view, are basically just big rhabdoviruses. So um, very few differences in terms of their molecular structure. Quite why they cause such a different disease is a really open question, and no one really has a good idea why that is. So these are filamentous, but basically with genomes that are coated with nucleocapsid protein, um, nucleocapsid protein on the inside, and then the genome on the outside, so going to be easily read. Um, the proteins, again, are extremely similar to what you see with the rhabdoviruses, with the exception of the VP30 protein, which is regulating messenger RNA production, and those that are <clears throat> See, what was the other one? Oh, yeah, the secreted glycoprotein. And that secreted glycoprotein, which is potentially providing cover, as it were, for the rest of the virus, and so that it can potentially help to avoid the immune system. And it's also kind of immune suppressant, immune system suppressant. But the, my, forget if I mentioned this before, but that's also true for most of the paramyxone rhabdoviruses as well. Um, they're also pretty immune suppressive. And that's one of the big reasons that measles is such a problem is because people will be infected with measles and may even recover from measles, but then they're susceptible to a lot of other diseases that they previously might have been resistant to. So yet another reason to get your measles vaccine, and I just found out I probably do need to get another MMR booster. So that will be happening in the near future. Um, the genome editing in these phyloviruses is a little different from the paramyxos and the rhabdos just because it is absolutely required to get the non-secreted glycoprotein. And of course, with non-secreted glycoprotein, that's what sits in the membrane, and that's what allows the virion to get inside the cell. And so if we didn't have that, then clearly the virus would not be functional. So that editing, which is literally just stuttering that happens in the middle of a coding gene, is absolutely necessary for forming the virus. And again, we talked about messenger RNA regulation a little bit. That's the VP30 protein dealing with the secondary structures that form at the beginning of actually most of the RNAs, but particularly the N messenger RNA, because that's the part which is right at the very beginning of the genome, the three prime end of the genome. And then um, disease, the main thing to be concerned about is currently the outbreak in Congo, which is the second largest outbreak of Ebola ever. Even though we have a vaccine, um, there are all kinds of political, geopolitical um, issues with that particular part of the Congo, and our cell phones have something to do with that um, in terms of the economic issues. So any questions on the phyloviruses? Yeah? Uh, you said that the one difference is they have the overlapping RNA and disease mm -hmm. so I was wondering, does that mean the Yeah, so the, the question is just for people in the back, just in case they didn't hear that. Um, would they do also have these overlapping start and stops as far as messenger RNA formation is concerned? And basically, does the polymerase dissociate and then reassociate there? It just seems to go backwards. It seems to stay on the RNA. And you can do various experiments, and people have for some of these. Of course, experiments are hard to do <laughs> in some of these um, phyloviruses. But it does seem as if the... RNA polymerase is staying on. Once it's dissociated, it's dissociated. The only place it seems to associate is at the extreme three prime end of the genome. So if it falls off, it's fallen off. And it's only going to be able to restart in terms of actually binding at the three prime end of the genome. 
that's so also going to be true here for the um, ortho mixovirus as well. Anything else? Otherwise, reminder, this is the last new material that will be on the midterm, which will be next week, Wednesday. We'll have a review on Monday. Standard 50 multiple choice questions. Okay, good and happy. Okay, so the ortho mixoviruses, uh, ortho versus para mixoviruses. I think it's a little strange that, you know, ortho mixes viruses are just the influenza viruses, whereas the paramixos um, have lots of different viruses that are associated with them. But basically, you can use orthomixoviruses and flu pretty interchangeably. Uh, some of the big picture things here, we've now gone from one big genome to multiple small genome segments. And so this is really sort of the first virus that we've talked about that has genome segments. Actually, pretty much the only one we're going to talk about. There are a number of other viruses that have segmented genomes, but this is pretty much the only one we're going to talk about. Um, and I just like to think of these segments where these kind of separate chromosomes as far as these viruses are concerned. Uh, yeah, all about flu, and then you know, vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. The flu vaccine is not great um, and doesn't always work every year, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. There has been some progress that we may or may not get around to the end, so I wanted to mention it now, um, in so-called universal flu vaccines. So something that you wouldn't have to get a new vaccination every year, which would be really cool um, if we get that to work. But they're in phase one and phase three clinical trials, different ways of potentially having universal flu vaccines. So I'm pretty excited about that possibility. So what are some of the, the key concepts? I already mentioned the segmented genome. And again, I just like to think of these as separate chromosomes, um, and they're really pretty simple because most of them just have one gene. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so segmented genes in one capsid, probably I should have, have um, specified that. So, yes, you're exactly correct. We have talked about those as well. Just tells my memory like a steel sieve. It's different for the plant ones because they're actually all packaged in a single virion, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The plant ones are mostly in different ones. There's the one case in the cucumber mosaic virus. We actually have two that are packaged. It seems to be the length of the genome segment and the size of the capsid. That's very different here. Yeah, I was just was reading ahead there. If you follow through the chapters in the book, those are the bunya viruses which are tripartite genomes, and um, remember correctly, they're rotaviruses. Sometimes they always get the 12. So there definitely are other ones. It's just the, it's the, uh, the one in one, one particular virion that we'll talk more about. Okay, more, more questions here? Okay, so <clears throat> segment of genomes, um, hemagglutinin, um, hopefully this is something we're kind of doing to death. Um, part of the reason for that is probably one of the best understood of the binding and fusion proteins for any virus. Um, neuraminidase, neuraminidase is the protein which will chop off the receptor and is really important for the virus getting out of the cell when it's being produced. And that particular aspect of it um, actually makes it a pretty good druggable target. I, you know, this, the whole idea of druggable, using druggable as a verb, I think is very strange. Um, or I forgot as an adjective. But, uh, the, that's probably actually the best anti-flu drugs right now are actually blocking the neuraminidase. Um, matrix proteins, we already talked a little bit about matrix. That's what's helping um, hold everything together, those envelope proteins together with everything which is on the inside, the nucleocapsids. And it turns out that some of those are ion channels. And the ion channels are really important for some of the conformational changes because it's the pH-dependent conformational change that we see in these. One thing that is also different relative to at least all the other RNA viruses we've talked about so far is that this particular RNA virus replicates in the nucleus, which is really kind of funky. Like, why would you want to replicate in the nucleus? You've got your own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Why do you need to get into the nucleus in order to be able to replicate? And we'll talk more about that, but the teaser here, or maybe the... Um, I'm not sure what the right term would be, that spoiler, um, cap snatching. So it turns out that the reason they're replicated in the nucleus is because they steal caps from messenger RNAs that are present in the nucleus as well. So 
rest of our outline, okay, where they came from. Um, again, we'll talk about disease at the end here. A little bit about the structures, um, binding and entry, major differences so far, really, as far as the other viruses. Are they messenger RNA production and to some extent replication as well? Um, release is pretty straightforward, and then the disease is a little different. Um, this particular micrograph, which is not one from our textbook, is one of my favorite EMs, um, kind of of all time, um, because you can really clearly see the envelope on this virion, but also each of the segmented genome parts um, on the inside. And this may be an artifact of the EM, but it just looks really nice that you've got these individual sort of segments here present inside this virion. And it really is, you know, multiple segments inside these virions. So what are orthomyxoviruses? They're flu. Um, and flu, of course, is just <clears throat> abbreviation for influenza. Um, I should have actually modified this a little bit. There's actually A, B, C, and D um, forms of influenza. Um, the C form um, infects both pigs and humans, B, just humans. And A is really the one that we're mostly concerned about because it also infects birds. And birds are probably the reservoir for all of these flu viruses. And particularly when we talk about disease later on, uh, it's that process of going from birds, sometimes through pigs and sometimes directly to humans, which is a really major cause of disease. And so again, not unlike these other nasty diseases that we've talked about, particularly things like Ebola, they're probably circulating excuse me, in a natural reservoir and then jumping into humans, and that's where the big problems are. And that certainly seems to be the case for, for flu as well. They're enveloped. Um, they bud at the plasma membrane. Um, there was, again, that you know, beautiful image that I showed you, semi-spherical, I guess. Uh, but it turns out that lots of fluvirions also have these very elongated virions. Quite what that means is not clear. Some people say the more pathogenic ones have these elongated virions. Again, I think that's really kind of up in the air right now. Pun not intended because they are aerosolized. Uh, but <clears throat> pleomorphic, highly pleomorphic virions. What's packaged inside? Um, turns out that the C and D forms of flu have seven helical segments, and A and B, which we're mostly concerned about, have eight helical nucleocapsids. And so the nucleocapsid, just as a reminder, that's the nucleic acid plus protein, but again, it's all inside an envelope. And as we've you know, talked about quite a bit now, very often it's the envelope viruses that will have helical nucleocapsids on the inside just because the packaging is really easy. It's you know, one protein that's associated with all the other proteins in an exactly equivalent way as opposed to the quasi-equivalent way that you have to have with icosahedral particles. Uh, and what's the problem with helical structures, capsids? Why do we have envelopes to protect them? The ends, thank you, Janon. So it's the end um, aspect. And again, you know, some of these um, do turn out to be filamentous as opposed to anything else. But nobody draws them that way when they draw the cartoons. Um, this is a typical, i.e., you never see them like this, uh, <clears throat> orthomyxovirus or flu. Uh, Ten proteins um, that are coded for in the viral genome, nine of them are packaged in virions. So we've kind of gone from the extremes of just the capsid protein in the genome to now almost all of the proteins that the virus codes for are actually present in the virion as well. So obvious ones are these guys here. These are negative strand RNA viruses. So they have to bring their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase with them. And so the only way that they're going to make RNA that can be translated is by bringing that. So uh, turns out that in all of these orthomyxoviruses, this RNA polymerase complex is actually made up of three different proteins. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about what they do later on, um, PA, PAB1, and PB2. Then on 
the outside, the envelope proteins, we have the hemagglutinin. Um, hemagglutinin, again, this is binding to the receptor, also has the fusion protein, the neuraminidase, and the neuraminidase is the protein, again, that will chop off that receptor, so when the virus is budding outside of the cell, it can be released, and again, target of most of these drugs. Um, then you have a couple of different matrix proteins, actually. There's the one sort of classic matrix protein, which sits right below the membrane and associates your envelope proteins with the nucleocapsid. These guys are not the scale. They would actually be much bigger here. Um, and also this ion channel, um, also known as the matrix 2 protein. And then, very confusingly, there's this NS2 protein. Why is it confusing that you have an NS protein in your virion? What does NS usually stand for? Anybody? Structural proteins and non-structural proteins. So NS, non-structural protein. So basically, people thought it was a non-structural protein until they got enough virions and noticed that it actually was associated um, with the particles. So NS2 is present here, and it turns out there's the only one that's left is NS1, um, which is then not packaged as part of the virion. So this is a you know, really kind of extreme case of all of those virus-encoded proteins are actually in virions with that one exception. So what are these? Um, and literally, which segments are they made in? It's not important which segment is which, but basically, each of these segments or chromosomes encodes one protein. So PB2, PB1, um, and PA, these are parts of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the hemagglutinin, Again, binding and fusion. Um, and then this ion channel protein um, here as well, nucleocapsid neuraminidase. Um, and we'll talk more about some of these proteins as we move along here. I wanted to start out with HA. So again, we've been talking a lot about HA in terms of the classic version of a fusion protein, a receptor binding protein, because people have been studying this for a really long time. We've got very high resolution crystal structures. Um, this binds to the receptor up here. Um, the receptor for all of these flu viruses is sialic acid, which is a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a sugar um, on the outside of epithelial cells, particularly lung epithelia. Turns out that the connections in the saccharides here are slightly different, and slightly different HAs, particularly the avian HAs versus the human or swine HAs, bind slightly differently. Um, that all binds here in this part of the protein. Then there's a fusion peptide, right, basically smack dab in the middle of the protein. This fusion peptide is generated through a proteolytic cleavage that takes place. Um, do all of you remember the proteases that are listed in the genome that we just talked about? There aren't any. So it's a cellular protease. So it's a cellular protease which is doing this job of cleavage to generate this fusion peptide. It turns out it's actually slightly different um, cellular proteases that are used for different forms of these viruses. So cellular protease generates these two subunits, binding up here and fusion peptide down here. Um, this is also shown cartoon-wise here. When the virion associates with the cell, binds first to the receptor, again, sialic acid. Sialic acid is present on the red blood cells. This is why you can use the hemagglutination assay to study these kinds of viruses. Once it binds, it comes into the endosome. The endosome, you have a change in pH. This is a change in pH that happens outside the virus. They get the conformational change. And so this little red piece down here, that's your fusion peptide. As soon as you have acidification in the endosome, that fusion peptide flips up, sticks into the host endosomal membrane, and you get membrane fusion. But then you also have this acidic, the hydrogen ions, which can get inside the virion, and that's that M2 protein. And it turns out that the acidification inside the virions is also very important for releasing the nucleocapsids, those individual little chromosomes. And so the, this process, the 
acidification of the inside, again, through this M2 protein. We actually looked at the crystal structures of this being blocked by the amantadine drug, and so one of the other drugs that unfortunately doesn't work very well against flu because they become kind of resistant uh, is this amantadine, which is blocking the acidification and release of the genome segments, which are there. Here we have, um, again, our favorite receptor binding protein, hemagglutinin. Um, this is that HA0 before you have proteolytic cleavage, which happens down here. Again, it's a cellular protease, generates your fusion peptide, which is down here. And when you undergo low pH, then that fusion peptide flips up to the end here and can be stuck into the membrane. You end up fusing the two membranes. At that point, you release the nucleocapsids. Um, and again, there are eight of these in influenza A and influenza B, seven in um, C and D. Actually, that's a slight exaggeration. We'll get back to that in just a second. Um, so it's the individual segment bound up with the NP protein and also bound on the inside, um, just like we saw with the paramyxos and rhabdos and phyloviruses. So the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase can actually copy that on the outside. The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is bound to both the three prime end and the five prime end. And what that means is that all of these genome segments are actually looped around. So it's just a single RNA molecule, but the five prime end and the three prime end are held right next to each other. And so the five, this five prime end and three prime end are both bound by the polymerases. Um, and probably this is to give a relatively compact structure because that structure has to get into the nucleus. So you have to get each of those genome segments into the nucleus. And unfortunately, don't have the nuclear pore complex here for scale, but these are really big relative to the nuclear pore complex. Um, so exactly how they get inside the nucleus is, is still a pretty open question because, again, they're, they're way too big to get through the nuclear pore complex. And there, here are some electron micrographs where people were doing reconstructions of particles, so the RNA together with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and then the nucleocapsid protein. Um, this was from uh, quite a few years ago now. A more recent paper, which I just pulled up last night, um, is from, <clears throat> excuse me, 2013, which is still a little old. Uh, actually has a slightly higher resolution structure, mostly because we now have a crystal structure of the NP protein, and basically this NP protein you can fit into these cryo-electron micrographs. And this one was actually made artificially. These are the ones that seem to be present inside virions. And so the technology has actually gotten better. Now you can see these helical structures and basically seems to be the nucleocapsid protein bound on one of these strands. It loops around and then comes back down the other side. These are not base paired with each other. It's not sort of a classic you know, base pairing structure that you would see with some kind of secondary structure. This is a much larger process than you would have like a double helical RNA. So each of them is all bound to these, these particles. And that's the modeling again of the nucleocapsid protein um, into, into these particles. So these guys have to get into the nucleus. And I think this is kind of a really amazing dance as far as all of the different proteins that have to get into and out of the nucleus. And I should, nucleus, excuse me, I should really say nuclear protein complexes because the first genome segment gets into, and actually it's going to be eight of these genome segments, that get inside the nucleus. These then are made into messenger RNAs. That messenger RNA is exported. It gets translated. All of these proteins have to get imported back into the nucleus. These then will make you know, anti-genome RNA, because again, it's a negative strand, so you need to make positive strand, which will then be used again to make negative strand. Then you also need all of the other proteins that are going to be part of your virion, other than the envelope proteins that have to get imported into the nucleus. That then whole process will get exported now as a 
individual segment back into the cytoplasm and eventually get packaged. So this process, nuclear import, nuclear export, nuclear import, nuclear export, is still a, a pretty fascinating process and a lot of it is happening around these. So one of the big questions, of course, is sort of why is this happening? Um, and we'll get to back to that in just a second after we have our first clicker question that everyone's going to answer correctly, right? So we get 100%. That's our plan. So, actually, I'll show you the question. That would be good. Uh, <laughs> how many genome segments does influenza A have? One, two, four, six, or eight. So we have 23 people here today. Two, one, not quite 100%, but yes, it's eight segments that the, these have. Um, if that asked influenza C or D, um, it would be seven segments, but we'll talk about packaging um, a little bit later on. So why are we in the nucleus? Um, that's because these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, all the three proteins, can't actually make caps. And they don't have irises in their RNAs, so you can have an internal ribosome entry site. Somehow they need to get caps. Now, where are the caps? The caps are in the nucleus. So, that's why it seems that you have this required replication in the nucleus. You have to get caps. The caps are in the nucleus because that's where the cellular gene-independent RNA polymerase is and all of the capping enzymes. So basically what seems to happen is there are your cellular messenger RNAs. Those are bound by PB2 at the cap structure and PB1 which will literally cut off this five prime end of your messenger RNA, and that serves as not only a cap, but also a primer now for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to copy its way down the genome. It gets to a bunch of U's. What happens to a bunch of U's if you have a negative strand RNA virus and an RNA dependent polymerase, and you need to make a poly A tail. You stutter. So the RNA dependent RNA polymerase sits there and just churns out A residues, um, and you end up with a poly A tail. The poly A tail, again, has been made by the, the viral polymerase, and then the cap here, uh, which then gives you a capped messenger RNA. This is a perfectly happy messenger RNA. This is what gets transported back out into the cytoplasm, um, gets then translated into all of the proteins with two actually slightly different ones. Um, you may remember that we have eight genome segments but 10 proteins. Um, where do those other two proteins come from? Um, it turns out that we're not starting and stopping, like we had with the final viruses and the paramyxoviruses, there's actually splicing that takes place. And so there's splicing that happens in two of your genome segments. Um, and that splicing all seems to be cellular splicing machinery. So a splice donor, splice acceptor, regular spliceosome, um, et cetera. Um, not completely. It turns out that there's some which are made as complete genomes and some that are made as shorter pieces. So that's how you make messenger RNA. How do you make genome? This should sound really, really familiar. It's about presence of NP. So lots of NP around. Then the polymerase switches from 
stealing caps and stuttering to just making copies of just the genome segments. First anti-genome and then genome segments. How it's being primed, don't ask me. I'm not entirely sure how that works. Um, so <clears throat> here we have um, just the cartoon of that structure. Um, if you have the <clears throat> NP around, um, extra NP protein, that NP protein, this is not showing up here, um, extra NP protein then will cause this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to start at the very end of the genome, makes your positive strand, that positive strand then serves as a template to make genomic RNA, and again, in the presence of this free NP, you don't steal caps and you don't stutter, so you make your genomes. Those then get assembled with the polymerases and the um, extra proteins. Those then get associated into virion particles. One of the big questions, of course, as I mentioned multiple times now, is that each of those genome segments is actually really big. And so it's tough for it to get out of the nucleus. What seems to solve that problem is this NS2 protein. And so the NS2 protein seems to associate with those genome segments. And remember, you know, NS for non-structural, it actually does end up getting packaged into virions, relatively small amounts. But that NS protein has a really good nuclear export signal. So it will associate with each of your nucleocapsids and then cause those to be dragged outside the cell. The only other NS protein, and this is really an NS protein, is NS1. Now, NS1 does a couple of different things. Um, probably the most important as far as we're concerned is it blocks these two proteins, CPSF and PABP. Okay, what the heck is CPSF and PABP? I forgot it because I learned it in molecular and, you know, that was last term. So what are they involved in? Cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor and somebody other than David. Poly A binding protein, which are going to be important for what? Right, poly tails for mRNAs. What kinds of mRNAs? Viral or cellular? Good guess. You had a fifty percent chance too. <laughs> um, but yes, the cellular ones, because what happens is the RNA pattern RNA polymerase will it'll hit a site that will get cleaved and then it will continue. And what that does is that makes a cellular messenger RNA that can now get transported out of the nucleus. If you don't have the cleavage and polydation the specificity factor and the polybinding protein, those messenger RNAs get stuck in the nucleus. Why is that to the advantage of the virus? Okay. So what does it need from the cellular messenger RNAs? The cap, exactly. So you're blocking all of those cellular messenger RNAs inside the nucleus, and you've got a bunch of caps. Caps are exactly what the virus needs in order to make the messenger RNA for all those virus proteins. So smart, again, just to totally over-anthropomorphize here. Um, the other thing that NS1 does is it blocks um, protein kinase R, which we haven't talked about before. Um, protein kinase R is a protein kinase that's stimulated by double-stranded RNA, just a second. Um, and that causes basically all kinds of cellular machinery to shut down. And it's an intrinsic antiviral system that pretty much all cells have. And again, double-stranded RNA is usually bad because it means that you've got some kind of virus genome which is replicating itself. And so getting that double-stranded RNA is, is clearly an issue. Yeah? Okay, so the, the, the question, if you hadn't heard that in the back, is basically, is it just viral messenger RNAs now, or are there some cellular messenger RNAs that are getting through as well? Um, the answer is I don't know, <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure that there are still some cellular 
uh, messages which are being made. Um, I think this is just shutting that down to some extent. Uh, one of the reasons I say that is because we always make a big deal about polio because that really shuts down translation, and I've never seen equivalent data for flu. So uh, I'm guessing that it's not as extreme. Okay, so now we have our genomes. They've gotten out of the nucleus, now thanks to MS2. Um, and we have the, the blocking. The last thing we need to do is to package our genome segments and get them outside of the cell. We already talked about the neuraminidase. That's what's chopping off the sialic acid. So make sure that the virions can be released from the cell. Um, all of this happens at the nuclear membrane. And the big question that I was always asking um, is, You've got eight different genome segments. Presumably, each of those eight is being made at you know, some particular amount. There's no particular way that we know of. If you have regulation that you make you know, exactly the same number of copies of each of these genome segments, um, how the heck do you get eight in one virion? So it's like we were talking about before. Uh, and the answer is we still don't completely know, um, but there's been some... Again, pretty nice uh, imaging technology, again, using electron microscopy, where people have looked at some of these particles. And it does turn out that if you do, oops, or now this has decided to completely give up on me, okay. Uh, the <clears throat> individual particles, and so this is now one of those budded influenza particles coming outside of the cell. You can do electron tomography, which is literally taking a sample on the electron microscope and tilting it at a bunch of different angles. So you end up with, oh, hello, getting a little ahead of ourselves here, um, tilting it at lots of different angles and then reconstructing a three-dimensional structure from all these pictures that you've taken at different angles. And when you do that, you end up with structures that look like this. Um, you can count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight genome segments present in one of these particles. And people also talk about this as the seven plus one rule. And if you just look vertically down on these, here are seven, and then there's plus one over here. What's really kind of strange is I mentioned you know, the influenza C and influenza D, those have seven genome segments, or at least seven coding genome segments. In their particles, they all seem to have eight segments. So one extra copy. Presumably that's just because this you know, packaging mechanism is such that eight works and seven doesn't. Um, this is a paper that just came out last year, and so we don't really know why and how that's happening. But just this assembly of genome segments together um, does seem to be important. And there may be some connections between these two genome segments um, I'm not convinced they have this big arrow in their paper, and yeah, so I can see that these are hooked up together. I'm not completely sure if the, how legit that is. Yeah, Janan. Yeah, it seems to be. And so you just seem to have one extra copy, and I'm not, it seems to be pretty random which of those extra copies you end up with. Um, so again, how this is happening, um, I think is a really pretty open question. As far as, as far as that's concerned. Okay, so that's our, we've got our virions, we're good to go. Um, this is an overview of that process. Let's see if I get this to work again. Yeah. Um, where we have binding of the virion to the receptor, getting into the endosome, releasing the nucleocapsid segments. Those end up in the nucleus. Your negative strand becomes positive strand that becomes negative strand. Also is stealing caps from host messenger RNAs. Those capped RNAs then get exported, translated into proteins, which then come back inside the cell. Some of them get translated into your membrane proteins, is your HA and your NA. These get through regular secretion processes, transported to the membrane. Each of your genome segments gets associated here, and you have release of each of the virions. This is as a, much a reminder to mention that this, the Flint textbook, which I got this figure from, is on reserve in the library. And one of the really nice things, excuse me, about the Flint textbook is in the back they have appendices 
which go over each of these individual virus families. So if you're thinking about studying for a midterm, um, it might be a really appropriate place to look. Question in the back? No. Just, just actually, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> another thing that I wanted to you know, kind of show off of, we have plaque assays for flu. One of the reasons that people are good at, at doing uh, studying flu, this is just a plaque assay that was done by one of my employees at my company here, you know, blatant plug here. But these are plaques. Um, so this is uh, your negative control and then just dilutions um, serial dilutions of each of these viruses, and they do make nice plaques um, on these cells. Yeah? Um, oh, so kind of getting back to what we were talking about last time. So Janana's asking, you know, do you need some kind of special approval? You know, what kind of biosafety level um, do you have for flu? Um, this particular flu virus that we're using is one of the hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about it later, um, attenuated flu vaccine strains. And so it's, this is fine to work with at biosafety level two. If you're talking about wild type flu, that's usually done at biosafety level three. And the uh, HPAI, the high pathogenicity, pathogenicity, excuse me, avian influenza, all that work is done at BSL-4. But yeah, these are all done at BSL-2. Yeah, we don't have the facilities either here at PSU or at my company, which is a bench in a lab, so it's really small, <laughs> um, to be able to do any of the BSL-3 work. Okay, so one last question on the structures. Um, <clears throat> influenza protein, most important for membrane fusion is HA, NA, PB1, PB2, NS2. I would say we don't have a consensus, so let's chat about what you decided on and why. We're getting quiet again. That means it's time to vote, right? Go again. And continue to decide what you what you like here. <clears throat> Discuss with your neighbors. Stedman always wants value judgments, you know, most important, least important. It's annoying. <laughs> Ten. Five. Three. I'm going to stop it now because we're at 100%. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so I'm not going to let anybody else change their mind. So yes, it's all HA. Um, NA is what? Neuraminidase for chopping off. So it allows the virus particle to be released. PB1 and PB2 are parts of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and NS2. Right, nuclear export um, signal um, and actually is still part of the virion. So not really, it should be you know, quote unquote NS2. What NA does? Yeah, so what NA does, unless somebody just quickly select that that's correct so everyone gets their points. Um, yeah, so what NA does, the neuraminidase, is so the, the virion binds to sialic acid. So it's this carbohydrate um, that's on the present on the surface of lots of different cells, including red blood cells. Um, the neuraminidase cuts that sialic acid off of the cell surface, and so it's released. And what that does, it means as the, maybe I should back up here a couple. Oh, oh, this won't work. <clears throat> if we back up here, where is it? Yeah, this packaging step. Um, when the virion is being released through budding, you don't want this virion to come back down and bind to the cell that it's just been produced by. Because this cell now has sialic acid on it. And so this sialic acid, if it's present here, the virion is never going to be able to escape and go and find other cells. It's going to bind right back to here, go back into this cell, and make more virions. But it's still that one cell. Um, and that cell is pretty sick because it's been loaded up with all of these other things. So what the neuraminidase does is it cuts the sialic acid off of these other proteins on the cell surface so that it is then released, the virus particle is released. So it doesn't come back and bind to the cell that it's being produced by. Does that make more sense? Okay. Everybody happy with neuraminidase? Okay, so that's what NA is doing. Okay, so let's talk about disease um, and why everybody should be much more concerned about flu than they are about Ebola, SARS, et cetera. Uh, basically, this is a whole list, and I'm not going to go through them, of the, the CDC flu symptoms. The one that I really like is actually the one down here at the bottom. Um, if you really can't get out of bed, it's probably flu. Um, it makes you really sick um, and really, really, really unhappy. Um, most of the other ones, um, your rhinoviruses, your coronaviruses, again, with the exception of SARS, um, is really, they're really not that bad. Whereas influenza hits you hard, it hits you really quickly. Um, the other reason, and this is sort of the reason that many more people should be concerned about flu than about Ebola, SARS, et cetera, is there are probably um, on the order of 40 million cases of flu in the US in any given year. That's more than 10% of the people in the country get the flu. That's huge. And what's the reason for that? It's aerosolized. It's transmitted. Um, anyone that is sitting next to anyone else in this room, easily transmittable. Um, flu will be transmitted from that one person to the next. Uh, because of this very high number, you actually have about, and this is, yeah, these are data from this last season, which actually is a pretty mellow season, actually, flu-wise. Um, over half, um, <clears throat> half a million hospital visits and depending on how you count them, about 50,000 deaths in the U.S. from flu. And that's just in the USA, just this year. So how many deaths were there from Ebola in the U.S.? Ever? One. So this is why people should be much more concerned about this. Most of the time, it's in elderly people, and there's actually lots of what people call comorbidity which happens here, usually someone is sick from something else and then gets the flu on top of that, and that's where the, the real problems are. And so, you know, 50 odd thousand in the US, um, a lot harder to get numbers for the rest of the world, but up to a million every year um, die from the flu. So what did this year's look like? Um, and even though most people don't think too much about the flu, the CDC is really good about thinking about the flu because there are a lot of people who die from it. So there's really good statistics 
looking at uh, different samples. And so if someone comes into a doctor's office, comes into the hospital, they have something that the medical care provider thinks could be flu, that gets sent off to the CDC and they actually look at numbers. And so here we've got tens of thousands, again, most of these are the people who are going to the doctor and many of these are hospital cases as well. Uh, mostly influenza A, a little bit of influenza B um, here in green, and <clears throat> of the samples that are sent, not all of them are positives. You know, many of them are actually something else, you know, not actually flu, but 25% or so um, are these samples. And the peak here, these are just the weeks in any given year. Um, this is the beginning of the year, 2018-52. Um, that would be the last week in 2018. And now we're working through, and this is literally as of last week, um, we've really come down um, quite a lot. Usually the peaks are here, December, January, um, and particularly this year. Um, See, so that's 28-19-08, is end of February, pushing into March. So actually the beginning of this year, there was still quite a lot of flu circulating. Um, Comparison-wise, year to year, um, these, this red line is this year, is the 2018-2019. These are some of the other years of flu. Um, you'll also notice that there's um, considerably higher, or actually you know, on a, if anything, sort of medium size in terms of numbers of visits here. There's this one outlier that we will come back to and talk about later. Again, this is just weeks of the year. So um, end of December, beginning of January, usually you know, December, January are when you have the peak. And again, here we're, we're pushing things out um, more into March, um, a little bit into April as well. Where is this happening? Actually, pretty much all over the US. Um, sporadic flu cases, even in our home state right here, a um, little bit more in Washington, a whole bunch in New England, which I'm not quite sure why that is, um, but still um, quite a lot of flu happening, even um, as of last week, well, April 27th, so it's a couple weeks back now. Um, but yeah, still quite a lot of flu circulating. One other thing I wanted to mention is it's um, also in Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Rico actually, if anything, has a slightly different uh, time scale. Often that's much more of a basal level. It doesn't seem to vary as much in terms of you know, when you have much more flu. It doesn't peak as much in December and January. And somebody, forget if it was in this class or one of the other classes, uh, that was asking me why that is. And the answer is we really don't actually completely know. There are lots of theories about um, people being together in one place. There's also um, theories about the humidity in the air, it's actually often lower if at lower temperatures. So, but these are, are really kind of open questions about what's happening there. Another way of looking at this is um, percentage of deaths due to P and I, so pneumonia and influenza. Um, it can be 10% of all deaths in the US in any given year that are due to pneumonia and influenza. That's a crazy number. And even in normal years, it's 8% at the peak. Um, last year was actually pretty nasty. Um, a lot of people died last year. This year, um, pretty minimal. This is the amount, so this, uh, these two black lines here are where we normally will have just you know, over various years, um, that's called the epidemic threshold, once it gets beyond that point, it's called an epidemic. Uh, but <clears throat> this is the year, unfortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately, um, this is, these are all estimations, so you know, percentage of total deaths due to pneumonia and influenza. There are, however, actually exact numbers for pediatric deaths because in, they actually do keep um, very good track of these. Um, and these are in any given year around 100 and this year is no big difference to that. Oh, pardon me. No major difference. Um, we're at 101 deaths this year. Last year was more, about 186. And again, remember compared to Ola, one. 100 times more deaths of kids, this is, I remember correctly, it's under five, um, who die from influenza in any given year. And that's, you know, remember the 98% of people who are dying are 65 and older. So 
be concerned about flu. And some of these kids are so young, they actually can't get immunized. So immunize so that your kids, other people's kids, don't get sick. Um, this is, <clears throat> was for um, the last couple of years. There was one, however, big difference, um, and that was in 2009, 2010. Um, we actually had about three times as many um, pediatric deaths, um, and that was the swine flu epidemic. Um, as we'll see, it's not all swine. Um, there's pig, there's human, there's avian, all kinds of mixtures of different things um, that happened in that particular year. Um, but yeah, otherwise, we're at about 100, and then we had this, this big blip um, right here. Quite why that causes more disease in kids and younger people, again, is still very much um, up in the air. So are you ready for a quick clicker question? Do you want on diseases now? Some people have asked me to do more of that. So <clears throat> the flu season this year is earlier than usual, later than usual, currently above the epidemic threshold, or more deadly than usual. Usual, I should say, on average for the last five years. And actually, I should probably have was, <laughs> because the season is basically over now. Seventy percent. It was higher, actually. Somebody changed their vote right at the last minute. Um, yeah, so it is later this year. Um, this is a bit of a bump out towards um, March and April. Okay. So what about this swine flu thing? Uh, one of the things that I have yet to talk about, uh, one of the things that happens with all of these different genome segments is those genome segments, there are eight that end up in any given virion. But if a cell happens to be infected by multiple different virions at the same time, what can happen is those segments can mix and match. And that's something that's called reassortment. And we know that this happens, and it actually turns out to happen pretty much always before you have a big epidemic or a pandemic outbreak. That's exactly what happened with the swine flu in 2009. Swine flu, H1N1. I haven't mentioned this before, but H stands for HA and N stands for NA. Turns out there are 18 different kinds of hemagglutinin. And if I remember correctly, last time I counted, it was 16 different kinds of neuraminidase. And as soon as you start to change these things, remember these are on the surface of the virion, this is what your immune system can recognize. There's lots of changes that happen, particularly in HA, a little bit less so than NA, and that's why you need to get a new flu shot every year. Uh, but as soon as you have one of these big shifts, people call it an antigenic shift or reassortment, then the population doesn't have good immunity to them. And that's why you have these big pandemics and the outbreaks of disease. So this particular one, um, in terms of the 2009 swine flu, um, it turns out that it's avian that went to pigs, avian went to humans and back to pigs before it went back to humans, um, and avians to pigs, avians to pigs, all basically four different sources. And so how the heck do you get four different things that have recombined together? Probably because you have lots of pigs together um, that are all interacting with each other, sharing viruses with each other. The pigs do get sick. Um, and so it's not like you have a trophic reservoir species, which is what you seem to have in the, the avian population. So this particular one, um, 
happened very early, as I showed you that strange peak that happened in sort of October, um, rather than in December and January. When it actually happened, everyone thought it was more like a SARS or something else, but eventually they isolated the virus and found out that it was flu. Um, and it was also really bad on people under 65. You know, 90% of hospitalizations, 80% of deaths, 87% of deaths were actually on much younger people. Fortunately, these neuraminidase inhibitors were still working. Um, the inhibitor of the M2 protein, as I mentioned before, um, almost all currently circulating viruses are actually resistant to that particular drug. Um, and this pandemic was over in 2010, and actually now most of us have antibodies to this. And in fact, this is part of the major component of the flu vaccine, which is currently being used. How do you get the flu? Um, basically sit next to somebody who has it, um, or in the same family as someone who has it as well. Um, not quite as bad as measles, where you can spread you know, four days before you have symptoms. You actually can infect um, people before you get symptoms, and actually long time after you're sick. So one of the big recommendations is when you have flu is stay home. Don't come to class. You know, and anytime you know, you're going to miss a class for some reason, you know, send me an email, I think I have the flu, I'm usually going to take that as a decent excuse. But that's much better for molecular, which is happening in winter, than this term when there's not much left there. So what do you do if you get the flu? Um, basically, stay home. Um, stay home, get lots of rest, drink lots of liquids, and you know, don't dehydrate yourself. Um, there are antiviral medications, again, particularly the neuraminidases. Um, they last for five days. You've got to start really soon after your illness, um, and they don't even help that much. Um, so when you have these, uh, maybe they'll give you one day less of symptoms. Oh, hang on. Ah, one too far here. Um, particularly um, Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, these are all the neuraminidase inhibitors. Um, and you know, one day less of symptoms, but those symptoms seem to be lower <clears throat> in the process. These guys, amantadine, um, pretty much all currently circulating viruses are resistant to these. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem to really uh, make that much of a difference. Um, it's probably, again, this, you're thinking about, maybe you're thinking about neuraminidase and the neuraminidase from cell to cell, but that's really a cell to cell thing, not so much a sneezing and transmitting that way. Um, the other thing, of course, is you just um, <clears throat> go to KFC and you can get your you know, Temi Flubiq, um new dipping sauce for all of your, uh, this is when the <clears throat> bird flu process was happening. So uh, <clears throat> what the, I mentioned this a little bit before. If you look at you know, peaks in flu infections, they're almost always here in the northern hemisphere at the end of the year and the beginning of the year. But in the southern hemisphere, it's actually right in the middle of the year. So it does seem to be a winter thing. Um, and particularly if you're far south in the southern hemisphere, far north in the northern hemisphere, whereas if you're elsewhere, um, it's actually much flatter. So something about being cold, being together, et cetera, um, seems to be a bit of a difference. So just want to finish up, um, and I'll yeah, maybe we'll talk more about um, influenza vaccines later. Too much stuff to talk about here. Um, <clears throat> so there are multiple pandemics. I mentioned the 2009-2010 swine flu. A um, big problem here was that younger people um, were dying from it. But every few decades, um, there'll be another one of these reassortments, um, the Hong Kong flu, Asian flu, and the really major one was the Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919. Um, over 500,000 deaths just in the US, 20 to 50 million people worldwide died from this, and a lot of people say this had at least as much to do with ending the First World War as any of the military processes. And a lot of these were young, healthy adults. Um, and again, quite why that is is not clear. Um, we just remade this a few years ago, and it's being used also at BSL-4, don't worry. Um, and the take-home message here is that really nature is the bioterrorist, and, and nature is a way better bioterrorist than anyone else could come up with. So vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. That's what all the rest of the slides are about, uh, and we can talk more about that offline.